Hey there, my name is Lexi and thank you so much for joining me today for this book review. Today we are reviewing the book The Mindful Millionaire by Lisa Peterson. I got this from the library and on accident, I think I was actually looking for something else, but this name came up and what really got me was the tagline, overcome scarcity, experience true prosperity, and create the life you really want. And I'm in an era right now in my life where I am very much trying to get out of, I am getting out of the scarcity mindset. And so that very first tag, Overcome Scarcity, that's exactly what I needed. So I went and I found this book. I got it from my local library, finally done reading it. And now I'm going to review it here with you today. So if this sounds like something you would be interested in hearing about, please continue to stay tuned. Again, welcome if you are new, welcome back if you are returning. Today we're talking about The Mindful Millionaire. And if you see a little head pop up every once in a while, this is a very bougie subject that we are getting into today. And I just so happened to have a bougie dog with me. Her name is True Couture. It's not my dog, it's my mother's dog. But I'm babysitting for a few days until she comes back to get her. She can go back to her mommy because you know i don't i don't have time but we are speaking on a rich subjects today and so bougie subject bougie dog true couture all right i'm not gonna do that voice the entire time but uh sometimes when she's here to visit i like to act real bougie you know because she's a bougie dog she is a yorkie she needs a little haircut right now but she's a yorkie associated with bougie-ness yada 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 y'all don't want to hear all of that unless you do but uh we're gonna get into this book review all right so I'm going to have this video broken up into two parts, all right? This first one we're doing today is the book review portion. The second part I'm gonna do is going through the I Prosper process, which is a process that is introduced by this book to give you actionable steps to changing your relationship with money and to overcome those scarcity things, mindsets, histories, learning your money story, all of those things. So this is part one. You got to stay tuned for part two. Once it is ready, I will put the little, the little bubble in the corner. I don't, I don't remember which side to point to, but I'll put the little bubble in the corner. Um, and it will point you to part two. So for this first one, let's get into the book review. All right. So as I've said, this is the mindful millionaire by Lisa Peterson and this was copyrighted in 2020. There are 310 pages in this book. Um, it's divided into three sections, three parts. And the part one is a new language for personal finance, which includes eight chapters. Part two is the I prosper process, which includes nine chapters. Part three is a guide for the mindful millionaire, which includes two chapters. And the purpose of this book it's that top line. It's the line that really hooked me on this, on uh, getting me to like check this out from the library. Overcome scarcity, experience true prosperity and create the life you really want. So that is the purpose of this book. And briefly, or, you know, let's go over my favorite sections, parts that resonated with me throughout. So the first one being chapter one, which is the tale of two money paths. This is on page 11. And this is talking about, let me find my spot. The awareness of how they felt. Okay, so my clients almost in unison would share comments like, I've never thought about this before. I never told anyone about this, or I can't believe that I wasn't more aware of myself and my money. Many times my clients would get so emotional that they'd become too self-conscious to want to talk again. I would later learn that just by talking with me about money, they each experienced a personal awakening. From there, nearly everyone started making changes. One left her husband, another quit his job, another bought a house, and yet another started a side business. The awareness they had felt, wait, the awareness of how they felt about money caused them to take stock of their lives and make life altering changes accordingly. And the reason why this part resonates with me so much is because oftentimes we're not able to change things because we're not willing to 
identify things or to recognize things. And that's a theme that, in my opinion, it really permeates throughout this book is you have to be able to point things out and once you point it out, identify it, be able to recognize it, now you can figure out what do I like about that or what do I not like about that. And this entire first part of the book is really about digging into the mental side of things, digging into our own personal mentality of why we are the way we are in relation to money and how that is affecting our relationship with money and how we treat money. So this part really, really stuck out with me for those reasons. The next one is in chapter three. Chapter three is called Stopping the War Within. And this is page 41, talking about the seven scarcity patterns. Um, and I wanna go through the first scarcity pattern. I do not feel safe or supported. The other patterns they have, it's I do not feel worthy of having money. I do not feel powerful. I do not feel appreciated for my contributions. I do not trust myself or others when it comes to my money. I do not feel like I am enough. I do not feel whole, complete, and prosperous. Do any of those resonate with you as I read off one of those seven scarcity patterns? The one that I most resonated with is the first one. I do not feel safe or supported, which has proven to be um, a running theme in my pursuit of superstardom in the music realm. I don't I don't know where to pinpoint it. It starts in my childhood with something as simple as, I never really had family coming to the games to watch me play or coming to games to watch me cheer or coming to certain, certain recitals or whatever. And part of that is my fault for telling them not to show up, but I secretly did want people to show up. So I think that's where mine comes from, but it just, continues to persist in my journey to being a superstar because a lot of times I will go about things with the belief that I don't have support and I, I do not feel safe or supported. This directly resonates with me. So it says, the first scarcity has to do with your fears of not being able to create a sufficient and sustainable income. This belief stems from feelings of not being safe or supported by life perhaps showing up as a fear that you are just a few bad moves away from destitute poverty. This is the belief that plagued my mother for much of her life, and as a result, it was passed down to me through conditioning. The fear of having the ground fall out from beneath me is something that kept me from investing in the stock market as much as I knew I should. Even though as a financial advisor, I'm aware the data supports a gazillion reasons why the stock market isn't all that risky as long as you have a 10 to 20 year time horizon. Yet no matter how hard I've tried to put my fears to rest, if I were to invest all of my investable assets in the stock market, I would not be able to sleep calmly at night. Here are a few examples of how this belief can be affecting your life and your money. Fearing taking risks and losing your money. Fearing having money that you could lose. Feeling like you have to work hard to barely get by. Ooh. Thinking that earning money is more important than anything else. And these are some of the traps that I've found myself falling into over the years. Um, to be transparent, because we always honest, right? We're gonna keep it transparent because we're always honest. So I don't need to say to be honest. To be transparent, to be totally transparent, I don't make the money that I wanna make. Um, I've spent a long time kind of like going through my finances and cutting as much as I possibly could. And I've finally gotten to a point, I actually got to the point maybe two, three years ago, to be very transparent. Two, three years ago, I got to the point where it's like, man, I wanna start enjoying life. Like I've cut out all of the luxuries. I've cut out a lot of fun things because I'm looking in the interest of keeping my cost, my expenses as low as I possibly can. Um, praise the Lord and shout out to my dad for helping me to pay off my car. Um, so I could get rid of that bill. That was like one of the things, um, I just got a car in 2021 that I was worried about having a new bill or whatever. It worked out, but I, I didn't like that hanging over my head. And just, I'm at a point where I've cut my expenses as much as I possibly can. 
I'm tired of not having fun and not being able to spend money on stuff that I want to do. Like even being able to maintain my hair and nails is something that I struggle with being able to afford. Um, and buying clothes, like I just, I wanna feel pretty and I don't make the money that I wanna make just yet so that I can maintain those things. And um, I want to overcome the scarcity mindset, which is the whole thing that attracted me to this book. It's time for me to step away from the era of budgeting and getting really good with creating systems for myself. Now I need to step into the era of, all right, we got this system. Now we need to figure out how do we increase the income versus cutting all the time. You can only cut so much, right? And life starts to lose a certain quality. Now I need to figure out how to make more money so I can enjoy the quality of life that I want to enjoy. Now that I have this discipline over here, okay, that's great. Keep those same systems, keep that same discipline, but now we're gonna play with a bigger, a bigger stack of money essentially. And so these things just really, really resonate with me. Next is chapter four, which is overcoming your no wait wait chapter four overcoming resistance to change and this is page 62 this is talking about the fear of failure another fear um let me see here the fear of failure let me make sure i'm going to read the proper part yeah have you ever been so afraid of failing at something that you are powerless to take actions how many times have you stopped working on a money project out of fear of not having it turn out the way you want for many people, fear of failure is one of the biggest obstacles to turning around their finances. We get so afraid of having something not work out that we can't even find the energy to try new things. First of all, I want you to know that no matter what your experiences with money have been, you are not a failure. Not in the past, not in the present, and not in the future. It's impossible. So I want you to let that go right now. Whether you have money or not, you are not and cannot be a failure. The whole point of this book is to help you learn tools that break through any sorts of self-imposed beliefs and barriers that are blocking you from what you want most. There is a very good chance that much of what you will be learning is new to you and will help you do things differently in the future. Allowing yourself the benefit of knowing you are and have always been doing the best you can will help to remind you of the fact that you are not a failure. And this is another great example of how this book is working on the psychology of things and the mental aspect of things. Because a lot of times what's cutting us off from doing great things, from earning more money, it's a lot of fears, fear of being inadequate, fear of not being enough. Um, what were those other fears that I read off? Like the scarcity patterns. Let me go back to um, page 41. Not feeling safe, not feeling supported, not feeling worthy, not feeling powerful, not feeling appreciated, not trusting ourselves, not trusting others, feeling like we're not enough, not feeling whole or complete or prosperous. All of these things play a role in well, man, I'm, I'm not enough anyway, so why am I bothering trying to do this thing? It's not gonna pan out. And um, I recently watched Inside Out 2, which the first one was great, the second one is just as great. Um, and I have to say, my favorite scene in the movie Inside Out 2 is when anxiety has taken over and joy and the rest of the OG emotions, they end up in like the imagination land and anxiety has, taken over the mind and has told the mind or the projections to send in all of the bad things that can happen. And Joy goes in and it's like, wow, she is really just going through, going to the extreme of what could happen in these situations. And Joy starts taking over some of the projections and submitting them and it's like, um, what if Riley practices really hard and instead of the coach not liking her or instead of her failing, what if she does great and the coach ends up congratulating her and the team ends up like, you know, it's like so easy for our brain. And it's also a part of human uh, nature, which is really annoying. We have to fight these natural human instincts, which is prone to negativity. But our human nature is to automatically focus on everything that's negative and only think about the bad stuff that could happen. And so we focus on those things. We forget that we can turn to the other side of things, the other spectrum and think, well, actually, what if it does work out? What if I stop being fearful? 
What if I actually am enough? What are some possibilities attached to that way of thinking? And like I said, that part about having that fear of failure, this whole first section, which I think is actually what most of these things are that resonate with me, are they all in the first part of the book? Yeah, with the exception of chapter 11, everything that, that resonated me with me is in part one, which is a new language for personal finance. In order to have a new way of talking to yourself, we gotta dig through some psychology. We gotta dig through some, some mental roadblocks that's happening in our mind, right? So that's what I really love about this book. It's digging into the mentality of things. Now let's go to chapter six. This is page 80. And chapter six is claiming your prosperity. Page 80? Yeah, yeah, there it is. Claiming your prosperity. This is talking about the prosperity ladder. Um, so not that you can really see it, but let me, can I? So that's what it looks like. That's a prosperity ladder. Um, so at the very bottom, I'm gonna go from the bottom to the top. So prosperity number one, I am safe and supported by life. Number two, I am worthy of having money. Number three, I am powerful with my money. Number four, I am appreciated for my contributions. Number five, I am trusting of myself and others when it comes to money. Number six, I am enough. Number seven, I am prosperous. And the reason why I wanted to read through these is because it's the other side of the spectrum. Instead of focusing on all the negative stuff that's over here, it's the other side of the spectrum of, you know, for every bad thing that I have, there's something just as great on the other side. Let me rewire my brain and give myself better phrases, better language, a better way of talking to myself by reading through the prosperity ladder as opposed to reading through the scarcity, um, what is it called? the scarcity patterns. Yeah. So I think it's a nice contrast going from those seven scarcity mindsets to these seven prosperous mantras on the prosperity ladder. And then the last part, we're going to chapter 11, which is page 165. Chapter 11 is in the second section of the book, which is all about the I prosper process. And chapter 11 is step two. P is for pattern. And we're on page 165. Um, this particular section is going through all of the chakras. And let me see if I can get like a little overview for you. There is an overview somewhere. I just have to find it. Mine, the particular one that I most resonated with was the heart chakra. Let me see, do you give, can you give me a list? All right, here it is, the seven sacred truths. To begin, it is helpful to see how each chakra acts as a lens for one central theme in your life. The list below depicts this connection, and this is on page 152. The root chakra is your security lens. The sacral or sacral chakra is your desire lens. The solar plexus chakra is your power lens. The heart chakra is your love lens. The throat chakra is your express expression lens. The brow chakra is your integrative lens. The crown chakra is your vision lens. And the one that resonated with me the most is the heart chakra, which is the love lens. And the part that I wanna highlight, this is on page 165, the heart ties into your feelings of being able to fully give of yourself and to fully receive nurturing. The more these are in balance with each other, the more joy you feel in your heart. However, whenever giving and receiving are not in balance for long periods of time, you eventually find yourself feeling a sense of depletion or selfishness. All things in life want to find harmony, and the heart is where harmony finds itself most welcome. This is because the more you feel in balance with giving and receiving, the more you can expand your own personal reach and create what you most want. 
The awakening of the heart chakra means a rising upward into an experience of unity with all of life. Love is the path of the heart that trusts that everything will work out in the physical world. For that reason, love is an action of faith that tells you it's okay to not be operating from defense, protection, and fear. That all will turn out in line in the end. Everything will turn out in the end. Even if you have no conceptual understanding as to the how. To create an abundant life requires you to believe in the possibility of goodness, regardless of the circumstances you are experiencing in the present moment. It's a very elevated state of consciousness, and it makes sense that you have to navigate through the root, sacral, and solar plexus chakras before you can comfortably and enjoyably stroll through the awareness that comes with the heart chakra. The, under, the process of understanding love, compassion, and acceptance begins within one's tribe, often the family unit, and then extends out into the greater world. Depending upon what has happened in our homes or within our closest relationships, we may or may not feel secure in our own sense of self-love. Woo! We may not feel secure in our own sense of self-love. How many, how many of y'all get a gut punch from that or a punch to the chest since we're talking about the heart chakra, right? That one right there, when I started digging into this book, like I said, this is probably the only one in the second section. And the second se section is the I prosper process. But there are just so many things in this book that's really like, ooh, when it hits you, you're like, wow, I have not been operating in my most positive self. And I didn't realize how that was running over into various aspects of my life. So right now, that self-love piece I've always felt like I love myself, but it's always been from the lens of, I don't want people to hurt me, so I'm not gonna allow people to get close, or I don't want people, you know, um, I can't curse, I don't wanna curse. I don't want people talking smack about my dreams or my goals, so I'm just not gonna share those things with people. And I realized that I started to become very closed off and very much, not open and not willing to like, you know, share things with people, not willing to make new connections, being very, um, very suspicious and mistrusting of other people because I thought that I loved myself enough to protect myself when what really should have been happening is I should have so much confidence in myself that no matter who I come into contact with, it works out the way it's supposed to work out. You know, and the best case scenario is I meet great people who can help me along my journey. I wasn't even thinking that way. I was thinking with a closed, a closed lens, a closed mindset. So, you know, and I've just had, you know, a bunch of different realizations over the past few months, especially because I've, I don't want to call it a breakup, but it is a breakup because I was dating somebody for a while and it ended this year. Um, earlier this year in the, in the top half of the year. And I just had all these realizations, like, you know, accepting the wrong thing. Um, in that relationship, I was encouraged to cut people off. And I'm like, but I don't, I don't cut people off. And I think unfortunately that relationship, now that I realize it, um, this is in real time as of this recording, that relationship was encouraging me to close myself off. It was encouraging me to shrink myself and to dim myself. And unfortunately, I don't need that. I, that's not what I need, especially for the type of industry that I'm in. I cannot have that kind of mindset. It's not good for me because this industry being in music, I'm a singer, if y'all didn't know that, if you're new here, but um, this industry is all about partially the talent, but majority about the relationships. And if I'm closed off and I'm not willing to talk, I'm not willing to go out and I'm shrunken into this little shell, how am I going to be prosperous? How am I going to grow if I don't allow the light? You know? Woo, that's a word. The seed needs light. The plant can't grow if there's no light. So why are we, why do we shrink ourselves? Why do we dim ourselves, you know? In that particular situation, I was doing it to appease somebody that I thought I wanted to be with. 
Um, unfortunately, it had a lot of adverse effects on my life. And so now that's one thing, but you know, some things in my childhood I got to work through. It's like, all right, I'm having all these realizations. And like I said, it's time. I love me and I deserve a lot. I deserve what I want. I'm not going to get that by being closed off um, and expressing self-love in that way. I need to open and I need to overflow and I need to shine and I need to reflect into and onto others. You know what I mean? So this book right here, this book right here, this book right here, I'm just, I'm blown away. And like, as soon as I finished reading it, certain pathways in my mind opened back up for me and I've been experiencing more positive feelings. I've been in a, a little bit of a funk, unfortunately, but I can feel myself slowly climbing out of that funk and I can feel myself going to a happier place. I hadn't been happy for a while, you know? And it took me a little minute to realize that this book opened my eyes and my eye <laughs> to those things. And so, yeah, do I recommend this book? Hell yeah, I highly recommend this book highly recommend it. It was a great read. The chapters, even though the chapters are long, there are sections within the chapters so that you can kind of break up into different sections. You know what I mean? Um, and it makes it feel like the reading, it makes you feel like you're getting through it pretty quickly. I read a majority of this book while I was on the road, um, to go visit family. Unfortunately, we, we had a death in our family. And so I was, you know, fighting through those, even those emotions, um, but trying to search for a more positive, mindset. So I got a lot of this reading done on the road, got through a good bit of it. And, um, I would highly recommend it. Like I said, this whole first part was working on the mentality and the psychology of things. And you'll start to pick out memories, experiences, relationship wise, uh, romantic or with family that will, you'll understand like, wow, this really affected me. And this is how it's affecting my money journey. Um, so part two is going to be all about the I prosper process and I prosper stands for intention, pattern, reclaiming your feelings, opportunity, story, permission, evidence, and reinvent your life. So if you're interested in seeing part two of this book review, which is the I prosper process, make sure you head on over to that part two. Um, there should be a bubble somewhere, but yeah, my review of this book, The Mindful Millionaire by Lisa Peterson, overcome scarcity, experience true prosperity and create the life you really want. I would highly recommend this book. I don't know if you'll find it in your local library. I would say buy it so you can keep it and go through the exercises that it has you go through the action steps, which is also what part two will be about. But I really hope you enjoyed my review for this book. My name is Lexi. Leave comments down below to let me know what you think about this. Do you have any barriers that you that were like ignited or that you resonated with as I was reading through these things? Comment down below, leave a review if you're listening to the audio on a podcasting platform. My name is Lexi though. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can't wait to see you on part two. Until then, my name is Lexi. One more time. Peace. And say peace to True Couture. She's sleeping, but sorry, darling. Okay. Peace. Saturday night, eyes hooked so alluring.